Good morning and welcome back to the colloquium on colloquium series on robust and beneficial artificial intelligence. I think you need to be Patrick Clevertois. Our first speaker today is, uh, is Stuart Armstrong uh, and Alexander Tomas Fellow at the, at the uh, Future Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford. Stuart has a PhD in mathematics and has been doing, re been doing research on corrigibility and modifying utility functions and the feasibility of intergalactic colonization. I believe that he'll be speaking on the first of these today. Uh, so join me in welcoming Stuart Armstrong. Thanks there. Um, yes, no galactic colonization today. That was just a minor side project that got blown out of proportion. Um, so is the sound working fine? Okay, so AI safety, um, I ignore whatever the official title is. What this is is basically a box of tricks, various different methods to make AIs achieve certain goals that I've come up with um, that don't really fit in any coherent theme. Uh, so we'll look at some of those. Now, the problem of AI safety can be summarized as AI is effective at unbounded, unfriendly goals. I've phrased it in this convoluted way because each of the four main words have different approaches. Uh, and if you can cut it off, and probably because there is still great uncertainties, as always, where AI is concerned. But there are different methods for cutting off the problem at different stages, like we have the box oracle, arguably interruptibility or satisficing, reduce the effectiveness of the AI. We have low impact or in virtual world values, which we'll see later, which aim at the unbounded aspect of it. You can have things like moral learning or friendly utilities to get the values. And some designs have tool AIs or other constructions. Now, one of the most important uh, problems with dealing with AI safety things is finding flaws, because it is very easy to solve the AI alignment problem. What's the quote? I myself have done it five or six times already. And most other uh, people who think about it find the solution within the first five seconds. And you need to go beyond that, realize how hideously wrong your initial solution was, and try and get to grips with the problem. Let's just briefly look at some of the ways the uh, things in red can go hideously wrong. For instance, satisficing. Now, satisficing means a lot of things. One example I've often seen is that you aim for a minimum expected utility rather than for a minimum utility. If you do that, well, the problem with satisficing is that it allows extraordinarily dangerous things. The AI can still do very dangerous stuff. It just isn't forced to. It's not motivated towards that necessarily, but it's not precluded from doing it. But some of the biggest uh, danger I, in IC is that a satisficer has a very strong tendency to turn itself into a maximizer. In fact, the act of turning yourself into a maximizer accomplishes your satisficing goals in almost every circumstance where you could achieve your satisficing goals. And there are other reasons. It's basically unstable. You would want your descendants to be a maximizer, even if you were a satisficer. Now, friendly utility, this is perfectly nice. It just requires that we code all human moral concepts. Um, now, philosophers have been trying for thousands of years to get all human moral concepts, but I think the biggest challenge is code. Seeing as how long we can get, how long it's taken us to get a computer that can say, recognize a cat or recognize a ball in a picture and seeing how simple in our hierarchy at least, the concept of cat and ball are compared with ethics, freedom, um, happiness, flourishing. This is uh, going to be a huge challenge. Finally, we have the 
tool AI variants, um, these have serious lying problems, which I'll get to in a bit. They are strongly motivated to either give you completely useless information or to lie to you. There's also a much weaker tendency for tools to come into maximizers. Um, actually, yes, the, the one of, yes, I'll get, I'll get to the lying in the next thing. So, by the way, this is a far more informal than maybe some of the presentations, so please jump in on particular ideas, because don't necessarily wait till the end, because I'm going through different ones, and once that idea is gone, I won't be going back to it. Well, I can, if, it, if asked. But we're looking at these areas, and building AI safety is something of a bizarre process. You have to sort of mix formal mathematics, the concept of what you're doing and the details of the setup, and they all have to interact properly. <clears throat> now, let's have a look at the Oracle idea. It's simple, you put the AI in a box and it sends you a message, and what could possibly go wrong? Well, absolutely everything. Uh, does everyone know Eliezer's boxing, AI boxing experiments? Well, I'll repeat them in case there's and if someone watching the recording. Basically, Eliezer imagined himself as an AI interacting with people who were keeping it in the box only through text messages, and in uh, three out of five cases, convinced the person to let them out when they had a financial incentive not to let him out, incidentally, just through dialogue. So we can probably assume that a super intelligent, uh, intelligence could do better than that. So this design is not safe. And now let's bring up one of the biggest problems, even beyond the whole issue that it might manipulate us, the fact that lying is a default action for an oracle. Why is this? Well, again, suppose you want to ask an oracle who's going to win the US presidential election. And suppose it answers you with a long, detailed printout of the position of every atom uh, at that point, or expected position of every atom at that point. It hasn't lied to you, but it's given you a completely useless answer. So when you ask for it to give you a true answer, it needs to be speaking to you in your particular categories according to our own assessment of what counts as truthful and what counts as misleading. Basically, it has to simplify. And by doing that, defining what the simplification and then still counts as truth for us is a very big challenge. <clears throat> the, there's other things where lying is default, like this is for the tool AI idea. Suppose we want the AI to give us a plan to cure cancer. And it's, we try and phrase it as a cunning counterfactual. This plan, if implemented, would be the most effective at curing cancer. And I suppose it comes out with a plan, unleash me as a sovereign AI and I'll kill everyone in the world and there'll be no cancer. Now, we're unlikely to select that option. But suppose for some bizarre reason we, were, we started to implement it, uh, everyone around us would say, why are you uh, doing this plan which has kill everyone in the whole world in the description of it? So actually, a plan that is more effective, if implemented, is one that achieves the same goal but is misleading in its phrasing. So even if you start implementing it, if the plan is misleading, it is more likely to achieve that goal. So we have, just by saying the plan which, if implemented, would achieve the best thing, we've already motivated it to lie. And this sort of thing comes up all the time when we try and get, like, it would be a terrible idea to just uh, have the us vote on how good we thought the AI's answer was or stuff like that. But again, we've given it a big goal, which is manipulating us and lying to us and misleading us. So the lying really appears all over the place uh, in oracles. However, I know of two ways of getting around this problem. So what kind of questions are we are safe to ask? Well, first of all, checkable multiple choice questions uh, in a non-counterfactual way. 
And second of all, counterfactual questions about expected utilities, probabilities, conditionals, and things of that nature. So let's have a look at the first one. This is, I'm calling it the verifiable selective oracle. What does this mean? Well, it has, instead of letting it give us an un, uh, unfiltered message, we give it a multiple choice from which it can select it. That's why it's a selective oracle. It doesn't tell us a message, it doesn't argue with us, it doesn't give us any extra information. We give it a thousand choices, it uh, gives us one of them. Now, what could we use this for? Well, suppose we want to invest our money in the stock market and we want to ask the oracle which stock will do best. Well, here's a, a list of, say, a thousand companies and say, Oracle, which stock will do best? That's fine. It is, if the Oracle can manipulate us to unboxing it by saying Unilever, that would be um, a great achievement on its part. So again, I help, I'm helping myself to the assumption that the Oracle can be contained. But which stock does well on the stock market is a very complicated concept. That's something that would be complex to get in there. So then, we have the second part of it, which is the verifiable part. Basically, in a year's time, we're going to press a big button and tell the AI or tell what score we got on it. So actually, you said Unilever, but that was the third stock amongst the thousand. I press that and I confirm that. Now, if you have the AI motivated to minimize the number on that button, a relatively simple goal to, uh, relatively simple goal uh, to train on, then as long as it knows what we're doing and as long as we are relatively committed to not doing anything stupid around the button, we can get a safe answer and train it with a clear objective. Now, what can we I'll get to some of the things you have to keep in mind with this, but what can we use such uh, an oracle for? Don't you get the wireheading problem? Uh, it's like a reward thing. Right? Yes, we have the wireheading problem. Oh, okay. It's boxed. This needs to be boxed. Oh, okay. You know, this is not, this AI is hideously dangerous if ever it gets out. This AI is hideously dangerous if ever we talk with it. This is the AI that we have to have the discipline, we run it once, we get the answer, we press the button, then we reset it, we don't do anything more with it. This needs very strong boxing for that to work. <clears throat> but seeing as to date I haven't seen many ideas for getting good uh, data even out of a boxed oracle, this is... Uh, so what kind of thing? Well, the, the stock picking example I gave there. So there's a variety of things. We can check every single one of them. We want to know which performs better under some metric. That seems uh, doable. Now, project funding selection. What do I mean by this? Well, suppose we have a lot of different projects, not AI related, but say to reduce bio risk. And we have a thousand projects and we want to fund it and it, we ask the AI which one should we fund, which one will perform best at some metric. The, the advantage of this system is that as long as the metric is sort of clear in our heads, the AI will figure out what it is in order to act on the button. But big problem, how do we know that that was the best project if we only fund in response to its answer? We fund one project, we can't tell the AI this was the best project of the ones we funded. But what you can do is say you have a thousand different projects, say we'll, we'll fund nine of them at random, give us a tenth, and we'll, our number will be how much, how well that tenth performs relative to the other nine, so that we can at least compare. Now, it is somewhat dangerous to touch this too close to AI, but we can get things like improved investigations. Same sort of thing. Um, if we have a thousand ways of working on safe AI and we can commit to not actually building any safe AI for a year, just 
working on those projects. And again, same sort of trick. We're going to select nine of these to work on at random, give us a tenth, we'll tell you our subjective impression as to how much progress that made or how, how much that felt. Uh, sorry, how much we, progress we felt that that project made. <clears throat> so we can actually get a surprising amount of work out of this extremely dangerous oracle uh, in this setup. Now, what are the risks? Well, first of all, we have to reset it to ask new questions, and we have to make sure we reset it properly and that there's no a causal trade going on uh, between it and other versions of itself. There's, um, I have a little trick uh, of this nature to try and break a causal trade networks. I'm not entirely sure how well it works, but I think it should work in this situation. And a reset means that we can't, if we give it too many choices, it starts to become dangerous. <coughs> the more choices we give, the more potential optimization power it has. So if we give it a trillion choices, it, that becomes really dangerous. But we can't chain sequences of this to get to a, a billion by just doing a thousand choices, then a thousand choices, then a thousand choices. Because this one is predicting what the next one will do, which is the next one will do. So the first one, even though we've given it a thousand choices, we've actually given it a billion choices. So those are considerations. Now, if the AI figures that one of our options will cause a super AI to be unleashed to then go and press the button for it, it will choose that option. And it will probably calculate quite well the probability of that event happening. However, if that probability is low, it will still go for the stock that it thinks is best, for instance, in the stock, because that has a greater probability of achieving a low score with a good stock than it has of via unleashed AI. So we have to be careful that we keep this low when we give it things. So stocks are normally should be pretty safe. Um, these, and especially if we're investigating actually safe AI, we have to really construct the infrastructure around it in a very uh, careful way. Um, and then there's, of course, there's a probability of humans looking into the box, asking follow-up questions, doing something stupid. Again, we have to keep this low somehow. As long as we keep these low, not impossible, but low, it should still be incentivized to give us the best options that it can. There's also the probability of the box and saying, I need more information, or you know, interacting with the humans in Sorry. some way other. Sorry, off, yeah. right. <laughs> Yes, um, if the box asks for more information, we turn it off. Um, I think there's no uh, question about that. I think you, even, you just have to design the output channel, so it's impossible for it to do anything except one. Yeah. Now let's look at the second model for oracles. Now, here I've added an extra thing. I call this the scoring oracle for the moment. Um, there is now a process on the AI's output, an erasure here. So, sorry, its output now is just numeric. And we're going to ask it to estimate the utility of a particular function u. And there's an erasure process e that will erase its message with a certain very low probability. And if there's no erasure, the message comes through. For Simplicity purposes, I'm, I'm just um, ass assuming that U has to be non-negative. There's a version that works uh, for general U, but it's much simpler with a non-negative one. So, we want to motivate it to follow this utility function, obviously. Um, now, ignore this, these terms for the moment, but just look at this. This is the indicator function for erasure. What that means is that if there's no erasure, the AI gets no utility or utility zero. It has no control and no interest in worlds where the erasure happens. Therefore, all this, the rest of it, is conditional on a world where the erasure does happen. As a consequence of that, 
It is not motivated to manipulate us by the content of its message, since a world in which we read its message is a world in which it doesn't care. So that's the first step. Now, what's this clunky expression? Um, this is a proper scoring function that is maximized when the AI has M as the expected utility of U conditional on erasure. So this is a counterfactual, because almost certainly we are going to see the message, and that'll tell us what the expected utility of U would be if the message were erased. Um, some of you might know this uh, as, this is M in brackets, M minus U squared, the negative of that, except I've removed the U squared term. Uh, that's just for various reasons in that here we can tell exactly how much utility the AI itself will get as a function of its expectation of U. It gets M squared utility from that. That's more just a preference thing. There are a whole bunch of proper scoring functions you can put in there to achieve that goal. Now, suppose we want to ask the AI, well, what would be the utility conditional on an event X? Well, that's simple. We bung in the indicator function for X into that, and we get this. Again, this has to be an oracle. If it can start affecting the E process or the X process, or something like that, it's completely unsafe. But as an oracle, we would get this. So what can we do with this? Well, we can test a lot of things. First of all, if someone says, I have found the ultimate friendly utility function, we can kind of test things like, okay, according to this utility function, if a nuclear war happens, is this better than if a nuclear war doesn't happen? And if the nuclear war happening scores higher, we can start asking questions. If someone claims, I have the ultimate low impact AI, and we say, okay, well, what if we open the box? What would happen if opening the box increases the utility? Again, this is a, uh, something that should be questioned. So it's very good for testing putative utility functions. People have had ideas for how to test them, sort of honeypots ideas, but all the problems all the approaches suffer from the problem that the AI is motivated to lie. This one is not motivated uh, to lie. Now, I still would not trust the lowest significant digits of this. Because for the moment I've been assuming that this is perfect. This process that we can only see the message if erasure doesn't happen. And that the AI perfectly understands what erasure means. Most likely it won't None of these will be perfect, so there might be a tiny 1% or thousandths of a percent chance that we still see the message even if the erasure process happens. And we need to worry about those worlds, but we can actually quantify, by looking at this function, we can quantify how much utility the uh, AI is willing to sacrifice in a world where erasure happens in order to manipulate us in a world where we still see the message. And especially if U is bounded above, we can put bounds on that. We can see how much utility it's willing to sacrifice, and we can cut its message at the right place so that it doesn't gain from uh, manipulating us. So those are oracles. Now on to more familiar uh, territory, value learning. Would any of you want to become murderers? Okay, apart from the... <laughs> I'm generally going to work from the assumption that people don't want to become murderers, or if they do, they don't want to seriously announce the intention <laughs> in public. But one of the reasons why we don't want to become murderers is because we currently don't want there to be murders. And if we became murderers, there would be more murders. So our current values tell us that we shouldn't change. And notice here that I'm not assuming any consistency or that we should be uh, following the past or stuff like that. Just our current values resist the change in the values. That's Amohandro's, uh, one of uh, basic AI drives in his thesis. <clears throat> so how can we get around it? How can we change the AI's goals? 
Well, there's corrigibility, a word which has a lot of um, things in it. But one approach that at least partially seems to achieve this goal is uh, indifference. So if you're changing from a utility U to a utility V, you don't. Instead, you change from a utility U to a utility V, and you add compensatory rewards to balance it out exactly so that the AI is indifferent to the update process. And therefore, the AI will neither seek nor resist its change of utility there. That's the old-fashioned indifference. What's the most recent result? Well, what about just stop it? This is um, interruptibility, which I did with uh, Laurent Rousseau uh, of uh, DeepMind. And this is more looking at safe policy change. So if you want to override what it's doing rather than override its uh, values necessarily, uh, then what can you do? Well, we looked at actual agents that are being used today, and this is the equation for Q learning. Q learning is naturally uh, interruptible. Q learning is a so-called off policy agent. It doesn't see its own policy. It, you can reach in and tweak its policy and it'll never notice or care. It'll learn differently if it ends up in different places and stuff like that, but it has no way of capturing inside itself the concept of my policy has changed. So Q learning is safely interruptible. This is SARSA. You notice the equation is only very slightly different. But instead of having a maximum here, you have the actual next action here. This makes a huge difference. SARSA is on policy. Because of this term, it actually can capture its own future actions. However, if you do a slight modification of that to have it not update on its actual future action, but on the action that it would have taken if it hadn't been interrupted, then this SARSA variant is now safely interruptible as well. Okay, these, an interesting result is also that AIXI is safely interruptible. Now, you might wonder about this because I said off policy agents were safely interruptible. And isn't AIXI on policy in that it computes the values of the policies that it follows? Yes, it's on policy, but only on policy by coincidence. In that it does compute the values of the optimal policy, and it does follow the optimal policy, but it has no way of tracking that it actually is following the optimal policy. You could shove in something completely different for its actual policy, and it would still compute the values of the optimal policy. So AIXI, in a lot of ways, is basically uh, safely interruptible. So is what you're saying here equivalent to saying that AIXI is just a Cartesian agent, so it cannot, it doesn't have like a hypothesis that, you know, that we can actually modify it's not, its code? It's so. not just that. SARSA is an, a Cartesian agent, agent, a much simpler one, but it captures its own future actions in its updates. So the rule for, you could imagine a, a variant of AIXI which took into account its next action or something like that. It, no, not, I can't quite imagine it, but you could, it's not because of the Cartesian boundary that that happens. So the Cartesian boundary helps, but it's because it really does not. <coughs> When it looks at its past actions, it does not look to see anything about itself. It looks, or its own policy, or values, it just looks to see stuff about the world it lives in. Now, what I've done here, is I was imagining that there was a process that changed the reward function for AIXI. So this would be uh, the equivalent of changing its values. And what the V is, this is the values, if you have your AIXI calculate V as the value of your policy, it will not detect that it's, um, it will behave as if its values 
uh, its reward function was never going to change. So in, in other words, even if it observed, let's say, several times the key and modified mm -hmm. its reward, it will not conclude that somehow it should mm -hmm. protect so, itself against. Suppose AIXI. Um, every so often we press a button and AIXI walks into a box and locks itself in there for a while. Um, then what it'll conclude is walking over there into a box is stupid. This is not a policy that I should be following. Right. What else is there uh, to learn? And then the next time we press the box and it's walking towards the box, it's thinking continuing to walk is stupid. Continuing to walk is stupid. Continuing to walk is stupid. Closing the door behind me is stupid. So, I mean, in some sense, you can say that it's a manifestation of its Cartesian. Yes. Um, and the reasons I put these up, so this is the true value function, which we don't want the IXI to uh, compute. And this is the one that if it computes them that way, it is, um, it is it's, uh, it'll, it'll behave as if its value fun a reward function never changes. But now let's assume that it has a little bit of reflection about itself. Then it will sort of notice that its past estimates were inconsistent or something's wrong here. Then if we give it another a compensatory reward of this form, this is basically the expected utility difference thing but in AIXI form, then even a AIXI that has some self-model some consistency will start, will behave normally because it gets the reward that it expected to get. So there's nothing uh, odd. Now, this is very roughly um, different agents types uh, and whether they're corrigible. This should be indifference, uh, value corrigible, uh, interruptible or interruptible if they know the environment. And roughly, these are the types of agents that are already of that type. And here are the ver variants of algorithms that can change it. As you get to model based with a consistent self model, the only thing that I know is the compensatory rewards. You have to balance out its values exactly. But as you go for model based with a self model, you can just get a, some variant algorithms. And as you have ones that are, don't have self-model, then you can get different. Um, uh, you can get uh, different algorithms. Some of them require a lot of more stuff than this just implies. Now, the reduced impact AI or the low impact AI. Here the idea is simple. You want an AI that doesn't do much. If you tell an AI that doesn't do much, make me a hamburger with these ingredients, it might make you a hamburger with those ingredients. If you tell a general AI, make me a hamburger, it'll optimize the world to give you the perfect definition of what your def criteria for hamburger was. What turns you into a hamburger? Sorry? What turns you into a hamburger? Um, <laughs> I don't think that'll be the most efficient way of doing it. But um, maybe. But anyway, so the idea is that so many goals, so you, our little you, our utilities, that are extraordinarily unsafe, become perfectly safe if we can shove in some sort of penalty for large impact. Now, what is this penalty? How can we define impact? And this gets really tricky because the AI is turned on. It's heating, it's thinking, this percolates through the world, there's chaos. It has a huge impact already um, just by existing. So we have to try and sort of filter that out somehow or come up with a definition. Uh, in fact, this is something that works best for super intelligences that are not godlike in their predictions. If the superintelligence cannot predict the outcome of a chaotic process, these methods tend to work best. But let's look at it. So the first thing is to find some sort of point where we can define what low impact really looks like. And an easy example is we turn on the AI or we don't turn on the AI. This is low impact. So that's a good thing to compare with. 
Um, so what we're looking for is some sort of distance metric between a world where the AI is turned on and the world where it isn't, or over the prob some probably dis t distributions in these worlds. You notice I've put them in a box, but the box now is not to contain it, not to keep it imprisoned. It can be made of cardboard, but it better be made of dark cardboard because the box now is to prevent us from seeing the AI. The AI is wants to minimize the difference between those two worlds. So if it wants to, the world to look like something where the AI isn't turned on, we better not be able to look in and check that it was turned on. So this box is to shield the AI so that it has the possibility of low impact. Now what's the first method? Well, this is what I call the 20 billion variables. <clears throat> it's, you know how sometimes when you come up with an idea, someone comes up with an idea for safe AI and you say, well, wouldn't the AI do that? And they say, oh yes, and I'll make sure that it cares uh, about um, people's reported happiness. Yes, but wouldn't it do this? Oh yes, I'll also add dopamine uh, in that. Well, what about free, uh, free will? Well, yeah, then we'll get people to vote on. So they keep on patching the idea. This is, we apply all the patches ahead of time. Something like define, say, a sphere a few hundred meters around the AI, and anything that's outside that sphere is fair game. We defi define the air pressure in Alaska. We define the Chinese, uh, the Shanghai Stock Exchange. We define the next winner of the Oscars. We shove in everything, and we get a huge chunk of variables, and we describe the world by this chunk of variables. And then the penalty becomes the world as described by these variables should be the same or very similar whether or not the AI was turned on. And one interesting thing about shoving all these variables in is that they, it means that you can add variables that aren't really well defined. Like I said, the Shanghai Stock Exchange results. That's a, quite a complicated concept, or well, maybe I should then encode it as the outcome of a, output of a wire which reports on the Chinese stock exchange results. However, this is the kind of thing that's very dangerous to give an AI, maximize some of the output of a wire. It could just go control of the wire and put what it wants. However, if we've shoved in enough other variables, it should be extremely difficult for the AI to take over the world to get control of that wire in order to re, uh, rewire it to its desires. So we can basically shove in unsafe variables or poorly defined variables, and they would arguably add an extra level of security. Basically, as we want the AI to be unable to grab the whole world without really changing a lot of these things along the way. Once it's grabbed the whole world, it can probably control them all, but this is to prevent it to being able to break out without affecting these. There's another um, way that is described in this incomprehensible picture, um, which is that if the AI is undetectable, we can assume that it has low impact. So if we take a slice of the future, and observe from it, and our observations are G, then if from G we cannot tell whether the AI was turned on or not, it's probably safe to assume that it has low impact. This requires certain counterfactual reasoning about an idealized reasoner seeing, uh, logically counterfactual, sorry, about an idealized reasoner that sees this and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this is another way of getting a penalty function. Now this is, if I was to use these ideas successfully, I would have programmed brilliantly a useless box. Now that we have an AI that doesn't do m much, how do we make it do anything? Well, the first idea is to just use that button the uh, idea that came of the Oracle. I actually thought of it first in this context. Just condition on the output of us pressing the button 
in a year's time, maybe give the, AI, give the AI the thousand stocks as an output. And if the AI is, turned, is not turned on, one of them is generated at random. So we can't conclude from the fact that we receive a message that the AI was on or not. Then condition on what we press in a year's time. And by doing this conditioning, now the AI is motivated, well, if we've given it the motivation, is motivated to minimize the output of the button while otherwise behaving as if it was an undetectable, um, uh, yeah, uh, minimizing its impact on the world. Ah, yes? Um, you have to think of all of the natural consequences. Like the, the thing I worry about with low impact, as you say, um, produce a, um, a cure for cancer, um, but, yeah, but otherwise have low impact. And it comes up with a nanomachine that does in fact cure cancer, but replaces it with something that is not cancer, so that you is satisfied, but causes people to get sick and die the same way that they would if they had cancer. <laughs> yes. Um, which is why you don't ask it to cure cancer, um, even if it has a low impact uh, thing. This approach only works when you have like a relatively small set of options, right? So yeah. Yes, because I had another idea that was very d dangerous. Because notice here, I'm not filtering on the content of its output. In this, in this setup, if the AI gives us the instructions for a nano machine, it's had a large impact because we're not filtering on that. I had a previous idea where you did filter on its outputs channel, but that's extremely dangerous. So here I'm plugging in the reduce, reduced output, and as it so select amongst these in the same way that a random number generator would. So this is, if you want, remember the first oracle works with this, where instead of having a perfect box, we have this motivation to control it. So it fits very well with my first Oracle design. But yeah, no, but nano machines that cause people to die uh, as if they had cancer would not count as reduced impact here. Because people would realize that there's nano machines rather than cancer. They'd start talking about this. This would have rather large effects on the world. This, this sort of balance is very fragile. Um, it, well, it's very fragile once you start doing effects. You have to filter via exactly via what the effects are allowed. Finally, there's another possibility, which is of getting <clears throat> high impact from two low impact AIs. So here, it's the old aiming the laser at an asteroid problem. The asteroid's coming to Earth. If we shoot the laser, we destroy it. This is a very high impact thing. So it would seem we couldn't get a low impact AI to work on this. Idea, we have X, which is um, one AI. It is motivated to aim in the X direction for the lasers. We have Y, it is a, uh, motivated to aim in the Y direction to hit the asteroid. However, they're both reduced impact, but they're both reduced impact conditional on the other one not being turned on. So this one is thinking, this is perfectly safe. I'll output my thing, I'll output the right coordinates, but the laser's gonna miss anyway, because this one's not around. This one's thinking the same thing. You aim the laser, both of them are turned on, and it actually works. Um, this. But you need then someone be able to specify what it means to have the right coordinates. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you don't have any way of specifying your goal, it's rather. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's. Yeah. But like the goal is not specified in terms of actual outcome of physical goals yes. or something. You are right. And I don't imagine that we'll be using super intelligence reduced impact AIs in this way. It's just the observation that we can actually get some very high impact by chaining together reduced impact in this interesting way. So, are what, you asking like my utility in the case where they're both on? In the case where they're both on, um, you can 
In the case where they're both on, they basically either that is an undefined state or a bit of the universe that they don't consider, or there is a different um, utility in that case. So what do you do the other try to optimize? Well, they're, they're optimizing, if you want, ux, aim the correct x coordinates, minus the penalty term condition and the whole thing conditional on y not being turned on. Now, this works for computers. It doesn't work for robots because you can keep the, the computers isolated from each other while they're doing these calculations. But if the robot says, OK, I'm working conditional on the fact that that robot is not turned on, so why is it walking around and waving? And then it enters some rather entertaining, undefined, weird states. Right. Uh, I think this is the final idea. AI is in a virtual world. It's an old idea. You have an AI that only cares about a virtual world that you define. And then it only does stuff in that virtual world, and yay, everything's safe. No. Problem is, the AI can influence, the outside world can influence what goes on in the virtual world, which means that if the AI can influence us, it can influence the, uh, the, its virtual world indirectly. So? It can infer that like, uh, the, it's running on something which doesn't exactly correspond to the software abstraction that it's supposed to care about is the problem. Um, and, and then it's yes. about the outside world and, um, and uh, decide they could achieve its goals better um, if it uh, turned this outside world into computronium. Uh, to better simulate its uh, virtual world. For instance, or just wireheaded itself via making us redo its virtual world. So here, but you, told, you sort of got into close to the nub of the problem. We have the virtual world versus the virtual world with our influence in it. And the basic idea is that we want the AI to know everything about its virtual world, including itself. And just for simplicity's sake, it'll assume both is deterministic. The AI is deterministic, and the world it operates in is deterministic. So it has a self-model that's deterministic. And we need to distinguish this from a world where we reach in and influence it. And that's why I've just defined it as the same setup, except that sometimes stochastic things happen. Um, these exactly what stochastic things we can allow is very tricky. I basically you can use anything that does not react to the AI's actions and that doesn't have an a causal uh, connection with the AI. Um, but that's a, a, a more subtle point. Then, what do we motivate it? Well, we have an internal utility function, and we have maybe a shutdown command. Now, since this is actually a Cartesian idealized world, we might actually be able to define shutdown properly. And we have some sort of utility which is maximize u as long as you think we're in that world, shut down as soon as you think we're in that world. And so the shutdown is basically as soon as it starts detecting outside influences in its world, it shuts down. Or at, to a certain extent, there's questions of weights and a whole uh, host of things there. <clears throat> so the challenge is to have a safe and useful uh, U and W. You can't, there are goals you can give it that are unsafe. If you have virtual humans in there and you say, seduce these virtual humans, even though it's in there, it's still unsafe for us to look at the messages that it might be generating. But what I generally think is that this is useful for testing models to destruction. W would be our model of, uh, the world W would be a model that we are testing and we would just want the AI to do massive amounts of things with it. Like again, you can do, if someone has a model of the stock exchange that actually is good, uh, but uh, no one knows how to compute it properly, then 
by all means go ahead of there. If people have models of cancer cells, how they reproduce and how these specific enzymes would minimize them, models of protein photos, models of docking. You can put lots of models here. Now, the most likely thing is that the AI will compute an edge case that is technically in your model, but not um, doesn't really solve the problem. And that tells you your model is wrong. You patch the model. You try again. It's safe generally to look at the outcome of this because there is no if, as long as we don't put something that is human-like in there, the AI will not behave in a way that will seduce the human-like entity. And yeah, this is basically it. So the AI is effective at unbounded, unfriendly goals, and um, this problem or the different part of it is possibly solvable. Uh, thank you. Questions. Mm, so, yep. set up with the message erasure. Are you imagining like us doing that several times until we get a message, or do you imagine us actually having the self-discipline of not actually doing that one again if the message gets erased? I, me I imagine us putting the probability of erasure at one in t uh, ten million. Okay. And having the self-discipline to, to say, okay, if, if that uh, die comes up. Yeah. Well, if that die comes out, we just reset the air and run it again. We have to have, unless we build one oracle and ask it one question, we have to assume that people will be resetting it somehow. The problem with resetting it and running it again is that it could then consider, yeah, well, uh, if my message gets erased, I get run with the same algorithm. So as I say, it probably doesn't get erased. So I try to influence what the utility will actually be by my message. Because even if my message gets erased, this causes like this uh, no. the only thing that's run further along the line to um, the same thing. This is where we have to break the a causal trade um, thing. And because as stated, there is no problem because if its message is read, if we can define specifically the erasure event that we're talking about then it doesn't care if it can set things up for a future AI's uh, erasure event. I think this depends on what you claim to be a solution to a causal train between copies of the same uh, AI. Hmm? Would, would you mind comment on that a bit? Oh, okay. Um, you said you had some solution. Uh, I said I thought I had some solution. I think I have a solution to a causal trade, and I don't understand what a causal trade is. So um, <laughs> let's see, where is it? OK. This is the setup. So instead of maximizing u, you maximize u minus the expectation of u given that you were not turned on. Now, this doesn't sound very dramatic. This seems just to be a constant term. But imagine if you had an a-causal trade, so a true a-causal trade, then whatever agents are a-causally disconnected from you, they will do the same thing in a world where you're turned on and a world where you're not turned on because they can't tell the difference because they don't have a causal connection with you. They might know the probability of this, which we would set very low, but they can't distinguish between the two. So if uh, some A-causal AI in the next galaxy, uh, sorry, the next universe, will build you paper clips, that shows up here, and that shows up here. So given some linearity assumptions about utility, this does not motivate you to engage in A-causal trade, because okay, the thing will happen on both sides. It does not apply. Because you're caught not also separated from the version of you that gets run if you get erased. Um, well, the. Yes. Um, you could try and make them causally separated uh, as far as they can figure out, or you could. The equation as stated works. Um, the question, because it defines a specific, as long as you can define a specific erasure process, 
and you can distinguish maybe between different copies and ask the same question. It, it depends on the decision theory that the AI is using. So yeah. you cannot really analyze it in detail without specifying in detail what's the decision yeah. theory. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Or we could say there might be some safe protocol for human beings to follow, which includes resigning ourselves to like uh, a future without AI help if the one in ten million chance comes mm -hmm. up. Um, it's the only way to be safe to be for the rest of of, uh, of humanity. Yeah. Um, I am confident that that will be implemented without any problems whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I don't think that's realistic because it also means that we can only ask them one question. Um, because if we reset them, even if the erasure didn't happen, if we reset them to answer another question, we got the trading effect there. So. Um, Yes, AI being asked only one question um, about, about a utility. I don't see that ever happening. But yes, um, a causal trade is probably a weakness of every single method that I've put up there, except maybe the low impact ones. But it is, yeah, a causal trade or variants of that AIs collaborating when they shouldn't be will break most of these things. It's a problem I'm aware of, uh, and most of the devious ways of manipulating AIs have that problem. Because, especially if you're trying to motivate them in weird ways, then trade means that their weird motivations will become more general and things go bad. Yes? Um. Just a question on something you said in the beginning that AI, um, by definition, is lying because it has to simplify things for us. And I think that is a different kind of lying than um, deception, where the AI gives you an instruction or tells you something while knowing that what you think it does is actually not what it really does. Okay. When we think about lying, we think about the theory of mind, right? That the AI can model your mind and it can model um, what you're going to think it does if it gives you those instructions or that information. So then, um, do you see a reason why you couldn't, um, why you couldn't keep the simplification while not having the deception, so that it that it has to that it has to model things or that it has to give you instructions? that will match what it thinks, what you will think it will do? Um, possibly. I mean, there's also the whole things that people lie to each other all the time in ways that are expected, that we fill in the blanks in what's uh, said, we tone down some of the larger claims, um, people who are always truthful with other people find this very odd, and this is are found very odd. And what I'm so th that 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 point is defining what a truthful statement is for a human is a non-trivial question. It has to be a simplification within a certain model within our model of what accuracy is. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. Now, if the AI was aware of the model, basically, if we had the model, we might be able to say to the AI, do this, this is what we want. If the AI has to infer the model from theory of mind, then it becomes very difficult to say, in your inferred model, which we can't really define because it's inside the AI, do the good thing or do the truthful thing. Well, you could say something like, um, I'm imagining this world without cancer, or we are all imagining this world without cancer. Um, and you, of course, would need to be much more precise than I am being now. I just gave a very simplified example. But um, with your answer, give us something that will actually do what we think we're doing. Because for us, this would be an extremely hard problem because we cannot, mm -hmm. we cannot infer what, what you actually, um, what's actually going on in your mind. But if we expect that the AI would be very good at deception, we, 
we assume that it would be very good at modeling outlines. So mm -hmm. then the inverse is true too, that it would be very good at knowing that it is being truthful to you or that it is, that it is yeah. going to tell you things that but, you think. But this is another version of do what I mean. And again, the problem is that the AI, if we program an AI with a bad goal, like cure cancer, it is going to know exactly how we should have programmed it, if it's smart enough to get the goal that we really intended to. But it's not motivated to follow that goal. This is what I was saying about the model of human and lying and stuff like that. We have to define what for us not lying is. And what we want it to be is construct a model of what lying means for us and then don't lie. And that, that was, that, that's actually at the core of my question. Why can we include the motivation to not lie to us? And we can take this offline if it takes too long. Okay. Um, I'll just say one thing, then we can maybe talk yeah. afterwards. It's just basically that we are saying we're not giving it the right, we're not giving it the full criteria. Well, it's just because we don't have a perfect theory of mind mm -hmm. for other people doesn't mean the AI cannot have that. But that's the point. We can't point to its theory of mind. We either, I mean, okay, some people, Eric Drexler, for instance, was thinking of decomposing AIs into modules. It occurred to me that if you could do that, you might be able to say, put the theory of human mind in here, put the other stuff here, other stuff there, and then use this as a definition. But in general, if you just have an AI, the AI is going to create a theory of mind as an instrumental goal. And we can't, if we say, use your instrumental goal to do something, then creating that is no longer an instrumental goal. Yeah, let's talk about the module approach at that. Okay. So more questions. Yeah. I have another one, uh, if that's all right. Your stock picking is not well. I think it's not as safe as you seem to think. Okay. Because it seems quite likely that in an event of such an oracle actually being built, uh, a lot of the prominent companies will okay. be to a large extent AI companies. And the fact that like either this oracle project will have like a bunch of money, or perhaps someone will find out that the AI Oracle pointed out this as a really, really promising company. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you will get a lot of investments going into this company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's... Okay. Well, I I... The, the reduced impacts might solve this kind of problem. Really? No, the reduced impact will not solve that problem. Mm -hmm. oh, so it depends on the parameters. It's, it's if one of the companies is a company that builds unfriendly AI, then this protocol can just result in this yes. company being funded and building but, unfriendly AI. But remember, if it has one stock that has 60% chance of coming first just um, via normal market effects, and it has another stock that has 59% chance of building an unfriendly AI that'll go there and press the button for it, it's still going to go for the first stock. Yeah, you, 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 I, well, there is... I have a self-fulfilling prophecy for any stock. Yeah, these are non-counterfactuals, so they will be self-fulfilling prophecy aspects to it. You, you can also have self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, it, it could be the case that whatever stock you pick, your attempt to, like... Um, put money uh, into it will in fact like decrease your expected return on on that um, so that uh, you cannot pick a stock that comes in number one you can only pick one that comes in number two but that's still that's still fine hmm. right. it'll, it'll pick the least self-defeating and the most self-fulfilling prophecy that it can But yeah, no, there are concerns of that nature. But again, you have to sit down and sort of think, really figure out seriously if, so you could, well, to solve that particular problem, you could just not give it Google, just give it Unilever, Mars, Pepsi. Um, <laughs> these are. Pepsi develops an unfriendly AI. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit bought by Google. <laughs> 
But um, yeah, no, the, the, there are issues and you have to think through them carefully. But most of the time when you say there are issues and there's AIs and you have to think through them carefully, that you have to be afraid that the AI will outthink you. Here, assume the AI will outthink you and assume that there, if there is a devious path of high probability, it'll find it. We just have to try and ensure there is no devious path of high probability because it has very little influence on the world. So um, we need to do our due diligence to check that choosing one of these is not going to um, break the world in that way. I mean, it would be completely stupid. Here we have a hundred different super intelligences. Which one do you want should we run? <laughs> <laughs> But what might work if we have the discipline is, which one do you recommend we, want, we would find the most friendly if we analyzed it for a year? If we can analyze that, and as I say, nine other randomly chosen one for a year, and then say, yes, actually, that one seems pretty safe. That, I'm, I'd have to think about it, because it seems that there could be other hideous things that go wrong, but it seems that that thing would be uh, potentially safe. So we can actually get some information out of here, but the division between a safe question and a dangerous question is not so clear. So a lot of thinking with that model. All right, so let's thank Stuart one more time.